I see the, the water is doing really good. Okay, so let me introduce uh, the first brave speaker for today, after the party. So, um, Ms. Mickey is going to talk about gadgets, so give him a round of applause. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> I'm sorry about my voice. I'm recovering from uh, a little bit of a cold. If I die in the middle, I apologize in advance. So, first of all, thank you very much for getting up this morning after last night's party with the Terminator and everyone. Um, a little bit of legal notice. I have to say this. Um, this represents this entire thing, but all the research, all the information you're about to see. Um, <clears throat> only represents um, me and my partner's opinion. We uh, did not um, use any of the information in our jobs, past, present, or future. And please don't sue us. A little bit of the agenda. I'm going to talk about who I am, who's my partner, because he's not here, obviously. Um, a little bit of review on what are gadgets. A lot of people don't know what gadgets are. Some of you are fortunate enough not to use Windows. And I'm going to move on to attacking them. And um, I'm going to dive a little bit into the technical. I'm going to show a few demos and go into the code behind them. So it's going to be fun. And at the end, a couple of words of what do we do about it. So Toby. Toby is my co-speaker. He couldn't make it. He still has a job in the US. <clears throat> what he does is a senior security technologist for a Fortune 50 company. I'm reading from the thing here. <laughs> and well, basically, he is an opinionated loudmouth whose job is to tell developers that their babies are ugly. And it sounds funny, but it's true. I can vouch for that. Me. Um, this is not my usual field of expertise. What I do is I break stuff, but I focus in hardware and firmware. So moving to JavaScript is not my uh, expertise, so I apologize in advance if you ask me something that I don't know how to answer immediately. But I do my best to try. And on that note, if any one of you have a question, please ask and interrupt me. Um, I don't want people to say questions to the end and you might forget a few. So if you have something, raise your hand or just shout out and ask me. A couple of thank yous. Actually, more than a couple. Um, all these people you see here and more are the basis for this entire talk. This subject has been in discussion since early 2007. Nothing has been done until now. And I gotta tell you, uh, I've seen papers from Tim Brown and uh, Dominguez Vega and the Secure Desk Group. Uh, they, they say exactly, almost exactly the same stuff you're about to see now, but they're dated to 2007. I only came aware of those papers after I presented this talk a month ago. Um, what else? Thank you for the help. When is on the list, if he's here, we woke up. Let's talk about what are gadgets. Who in here knows what are gadgets? Don't don't be don't be shy. Raise your hands high. Okay, a lot of people know. How many use gadgets? I'm sorry. I, I apologize in advance. Um, okay, so those for for those of you who don't use gadgets, um, they're basically very simple, very easy to make programs, HTML based. They, <coughs> sorry. that are part of the Windows Vista 7 operating system, until recently also was in the, a beta of 8. Um, what they do is allow um, users in Windows to emulate what Mac users call widgets, and uh, just 
display information, be helpful on the screen. It's a good idea, not so well implemented security-wise. Um, some of the gadgets out there are very useful. CPU consumption, memory usage, sitting on the desktop all the time. Um, you have GPU usage gadgets, um, antivirus gadgets on the desktop. A ton of them. But the simplest ones are this. CPU, from the left to the right, CPU, our assess reader, and weather. So, a little bit of history. We assume that this whole thing started with active desktop at XP98. You know, remember that? When you, anyone doesn't remember active desktop? Okay, so just a quick repeat. You can put a, a HTML in the background and it will update the background. That's it. Vista, that was a good start. They called it the sidebar, literally was on the side. What they did was to put, um, if, I'm, I'm saying this because I didn't have the fortunate, to, the, the luck to use this stuff, thank God. I, I skipped from XP to, to 7. So, Vista, they had the sidebar in the side. You had all the gadgets you have today, only locked in the right, left, top position of the OS. Here's how it looked like. <coughs> You didn't get enough um, flexibility to move it around. In, in Windows 7, what they did was improve it, but not security-wise. What they did was they just detached it from the side and enabled the users to put the gadgets wherever they want on the screen, put them on top all the time, which is very useful if you, if you like uh, updated information in front of you all the time. But um, in 7, it still runs in a single process. It's the sidebar EXE process. It's not uh, multi-threaded, nothing, just one. Um, they added enterprise security features like um, GPO, MSG, I will talk about that later. And more documentation to help developers, basically. Um, they had three pages or four pages for Vista, web pages, I mean. And they added more and more for it's because in 7 they, they announced this gadget platform, this is going to be great, this is going to be awesome. This is how it looks in 7, it's the same thing as Vista, only released from the side prison. You get Pandora gadget, which is very useful by the way, although I wouldn't use it now. Um, converter gadget, you can use this converter thing to change measurements, it's good for the Americans visiting here. Piano Gadget, this is a funny one. Um, before Microsoft retired the live gallery because of gadgets dying, they had about 50 to 60 gadgets on their page. <coughs> one of them was the Piano Gadget. Not so useful, and I will show this in a demo. It's funny. So, why does this all matter? Who cares? The gadget uses them to the client. No one's actually using them except the 13 year olds who play with a computer. But this development style, using app containers like um, Good or any other company that makes the app containers, it's easy for developers. You have this big framework some company developed, and you have a ton of new, new to iOS developers that want to do iOS apps, and you just do HTML-based apps for iOS, package it and send it. That's it, just an example, same goes for Android, <clears throat> whatever. So this is about, this style of development is taking off. I'm going to talk about the risks of it. So creating gadgets. What are gadgets? The gadgets are basically a library that is zipped and renamed to .gadget. That's it. How does it look like? This is the, the directory structure of a gadget, basically. You have your CSS folder, where you put your CSS in. Images, JavaScript. You have the about page, uh, flyout. I'm going to show you what exactly it means in just a second. 
um, the gadget HTML, the gadget XML, which is the manifest that describes to the OS what's in the gadget, what icons to use to display the user, copyright, URL. I'm going to show that in a second, too. <coughs> Any other images you want to see, and the settings. So I'm just going to show you uh, quick what I'm talking about in the RSS gadget in Windows once the resolution straightens it out. So this is the RSS gadget in um, Windows, the default one. You can make it bigger. If, um, if you click on one of them, you see this thing. This is, this is what's called the flyout. It has its own HTML page you can use to um, fill it up. You got the settings. This is another HTML-based page. That's it. It's that simple. All you gotta do is uh, stick to the format, the layout of the files, build them as you go, run the gadget, and you're good. Now, the gadget XML. How does the manifest look like? Can everyone see this? The back? <coughs> Nod? Someone? Okay. Um, as I said, this describes the gadget to everyone. You see, you have the name of the gadget over here. A namespace, no one uses that version, irrelevant. Author's name, if you want to put something to link back to you. Information. Logo, that's the logo that, that, that gets displayed when you view the gadget in the gadget operating system. And the um, framework, the sidebar. Um, I mean, is this? So I do explain this thing. When you right-click and hit gadgets, you see this page. And if you click on a gadget, you can see all the details at the bottom. So the RSS, you see this is the version, this is the name, this is the author, that's the URL information. But that's not the uh, the fun part yet. <coughs> I'm so sorry for coughing. The fun part is this. Anyone, everyone can see this? This is documented as follows. The permission level and the XML, the gadget XML, must be set to full by default. There is no other value. It's full, and it, it expects full. And that's it. That's all you gotta do, take a gadget, modify it a little bit, the uh, text editor, and you got a new whole new gadget. Whoops.
As for code signing, code signing of a gadget is basically signing an archive. But in Microsoft, it's not very simple. You have to uh, archive the directory in an MSZIP format or a CAP format, and then sign it manually. Unless you have a cool tool. If you sign it manually, I guarantee you a couple of gray hairs. This is how it looks like when you install a gadget. This is installing an unsigned gadget. You have install, don't install, that's it. It doesn't seem like a binary at all, right? It's just a gadget, who cares? And a little warning at the bottom, right, to scare you. So, gadgets are very similar to HTML applications. Bless you. And they run at the, at the user level, at the, at the operating system. Whoever runs the gadget, the gadget runs as him. If it's a user or an administrator. <coughs> a gadget can instantiate any installed ActiveX control in the operating system. So it's, if it's installed, and a gadget can run it, use it, and you won't know about it. I'll show you a demo of this soon. Uh, UAC. UAC is fun. If a gadget tries to access um, a privileged executable or a privileged part of the OS, you will not get a UAC prompt. It will just fail. That's failing gracefully. You can try, but you won't see the UAC prompt, which is the only, I think it's the only scenario I know of that the UAC prompt will not display. Any questions so far? Okay. And, well, parental controls apply. It's the same as the web browser. It's the uh, uh, sidebar process uses the IE engine. So a lot of it's similar. So some of the enterprise controls for all of you enterprise folks here. You can, from GPO, you can set to turn off the sidebar, disable it completely. Um, and they, um, force installation of only signed gadgets. And that's only relevant to gadgets you, do gadgets you download and double click. If you manually decompress them into the folder, they will install, even though you have the policy there. You can turn off user install gadgets, and there is a little link. Sorry, there's a little link that says "Get more gadgets online," which is not uh, working anymore since gadget, since Microsoft retired the gallery, the live gallery, whatever they had there, the 50 gadgets, and uh, you can overwrite that and just put your own. I'm saying that because there are there are corporations who have. Um, their own gadget store, internal systems with interfacing with internally developed gadgets. Um, and they want to host that and they, they build a store and they put a link in the operating system of all their users to go there. So we're attacking, that's the fun part, right? Two ways, attacking with gadgets and attacking the gadgets. Tagging with gadgets is the easy part. You, you write your own malicious gadget, and you send it to someone. Okay? Who suspect the gadget? Who knows what a gadget is? So you send them a gift. People are like, oh yeah, cool, oh, install this gadget. This is the new CNN blah blah gadget. And all you did was you take the legitimate gadget, download it, unpack it, change the code to include your own malicious code, Repack it back and send it along the way. No one will be wiser. <clears throat> no, the, the gadgets are not perceived to be to be dangerous. Basically, they can do whatever a binary can do. Only in JavaScript and the AV will not look at it unless you have shell code. In it. So what about it? So install the gadget. So what? You run my code. I own you. 
Just that. But that's the basic thing. First thing I ever did with a gadget was run calc. So shell dot run calc. That's how simple it is in JavaScript and a gadget. No, no, no hus, no puff, no puff, no hus. Sorry, my English is not my first language. What else you can do? You can open your URLs. Actually, I'm going to show you soon. Which is very important because gadgets share the same cache as the IE. Um, I have a demo of a gadget using this feature or um, option to write on the, on the fact that some users just don't log out of Gmail. So let's have a gadget open Gmail and you're still logged on and the gadget will send email. And the same goes if it's done for a banking software that you remember to log in for your bank. It's just there, you open the browser, you hit enter, you're in the page, you the, I'll show you in a bit. You can create files with whatever you want, wherever you want. Well, not whatever, um, depends on the user level. If you're a normal user, not administrator, you can put them wherever you, the user has access to. The default location of writing a file is the user desktop. So you just write file, write content to a file, or show on the desktop, which is very useful if you want to attack someone. You can read files, which is good if you want to send a Trojan to someone. And make your computer speak. an attacker in gadgets is the send keys function. What, you, what can you do with send keys? You can open calculator in a, in a new way. I mean, not just run from a shell, open calc, or download the binary from a website. You just go like this, and I hope to God this one. Jack off, we got you. 
this. I wasn't planning on trying this gadget, but I'm going to review its code, so I apologize in advance for the music. <laughs> Please work. What the hell? Again. No, no. I'm gonna just review the code. Um, I have a, I have a recording of this. I'll just show the recording without the sound, I'm sorry. Pay 
pays the charges to the Bank of Kazakhstan, Borat, a whole bunch of information. I guess at some point I got tired of fake city, fake state. And submit. When you hit submit, it says the selected account does not have sufficient funds in it. Mistakenly transferred funds to nowhere. Let's see what's in this thing. This is it. So the object. Oh, I forgot to mention this. The, the, the reason you see the opening window at the end and everything is timed out is because you have to. If you time it out to happen after you open the window, it will open. It will happen in the window context. If I send the keys before the window is open, it won't do anything. So that's why the set timeout function. So you start with this point, you open the main page. Once that opens, five seconds later, it goes to tap and enter because it remembers the credential. And then because we're already in the session, we redirect to the wire transfer page. And then we search for a date of payment, and we put in the data, and I hit enter. This is just the data. Lines. A very long line is because it's full of data. That's it. Very simple, very easy. Questions? Um, well, I have one. Sure. So, can you hide? Uh, the browser window? Um, no, you can do something better than that. Um, because you can, you, you have shell access, what you do is simple. You go and do a scheduled task to run after the computer has not been used for 60 minutes. So you know the computer's on and no one's near, near the computer, which is a feature of Microsoft Windows. And you, you can make your gadget run as the first gadget when the sidebar process starts. So you say, start the sidebar process when the computer is idle for 60 minutes and have this gadget run first. And it will do what it, does, what it has to do, its malicious thing. Mark for itself somewhere. Like write, write a file to this saying, I'm done. And from that point on, with a simple check if this file exists or not, it will be a normal gadget. Any more questions? Please, read. Oh, read your hand, Jack. Uh, has Microsoft said what the legitimate use of sending keys is? Why have they used it in any of their gadgets? Um, I have no idea why they have it there. I haven't seen it in any gadget. And no, I have no idea. But the point is, uh, it's not a part of the, the gadget framework. It's an ActiveX control. It's enabled. So you can access it from the gadget framework. So because you can access it, you can do whatever you want. And one of the things is send keys. But uh, they didn't say why they're allowed. So such a free access to ActiveX controls. Any more questions? Please. <laughs> Uh, can you access browser cookies? Um, you can use them. I know. I haven't tried accessing them. Can you use cookies and then uh, Ajax? Uh, if, the cookies, if the cookies are valid, then basically you can log into that web page that uses the cookies. You can use cookies and Ajax request uh, to bypass uh, the browser uh, using? Because they use the same cache, I assume so. I haven't tried it. You should try it. What do you see as countermeasures? What, sorry? As defend, on the defend part. Oh, defense part? Yes. Remove it. <laughs> Don't use it. Remove it. I will talk about this in a minute. Uh, any more questions? Just shout. Oops. Mm -hmm. 
So, they're code, therefore they're vulnerable. Fun. So what you do when you want to attack, you, you search for gadgets, you find gadgets online, you analyze them, you see if they send requests and receive requests, or if you can just make them do nasty stuff, and profit. It is as easy as it sounds. You don't have to be a genius to start weaponizing gadgets. Okay. Attacking gadgets, I forgot to mention that. <coughs> when we were looking for gadgets online, this was four months ago, you get a lot of malware, a lot of malware. Install this gadget, download this executable. Okay. Bless you. Plenty, plenty of malware specimens that are not even gadgets. They're just executable, that are Trojans, and at the end they allow you to install like a gadget. Many sites that claim to be Windows sites like Windows7Gadgets.com or DownloadThisGadget.com, some weird stuff. Um, none of, most, most of them never use SSL. Um, lots of ad server connections, but no, no really display, not really displaying any ads, just connecting. Um, a couple of primary coders, I mean, you see the same code shared between gadgets, from all the gadgets we analyzed. Um, it's copy-paste, basically, pieces of the code, so it's either a developer copying from another developer, or one developer making a, a several gadgets and just copying the functionality. If you find a problem with one, you'll probably find a problem with another. So, what do we have out there? We have poor security practices with gadgets. Very easy targets. Multiple ways to inject code. Gadgets pull down, a lot of gadgets pull down JavaScript files to update themselves. So if you have, if you're in the vicinity and you have AirPawn, and, or you have a proxy, you can intercept those requests and just do whatever you want. As I said in the beginning, the default permission is full, because that's what it is. Traffic sniffing and easy to spot. How many of you, uh, don't be shy, use Windows 7 64-bit? Thank you. The sidebar process only in Windows 64-bit adds one header to the HTTP requests. The header is UA-CPU, and it states that the operating system is 64-bit. Nothing else that I've seen uses that header. Do any one of you know what that header is? Have you, have you heard of this before today? Okay, I'll show you a request. This is what the piano gadget request looks like. This is the request being sent. And as you see, this is the header being added. This is how you spot gadget traffic in Windows 7 64-bit. So if you open the sidebar and it connects to the internet, people can know that that request came from a 64-bit Windows machine and it runs gadgets. If it, they can intercept that JavaScript request, they own your machine. The only reference I've seen to this is in IE 3 and 4. Wait. Ah. Windows Mobile as well. Yes, it's, uh, the header is used for um, specifying the architecture. Do you know what the header value is for Windows Mobile? Oh, so yes, so they put, they put R when it's Windows Mobile. seen the proof. There is a request being something like that. So traffic 
just they think implementing SSL is very hard, you know. Who wants to do it when you can have the option not to implement it at all? So you, you run your gadget and say, oh, I need to update the locale, so I'll just pull the JavaScript file from somewhere. I don't need SSL. Ridiculous. That's why most of the gadgets, most of them, not all of them, um, pull their SSL. Just one used SSL. One. The Pandora gadget uses SSL. Fun part. So as I said, you can airplane your way into someone's computer. All you gotta do is listen to those requests with that header, 64. Once you get that header, you check if it's JavaScript, JSP, whatever, and replace it quickly with your code. Uh, with 1K, you can own someone with a reverse interpreter shell, which I'm gonna show in a second. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you um, a demo of a simple HTTP proxy. <coughs> Uh, it's a Python proxy that I modified to um, look for the header and look for JavaScript files. That this um, this is a proxy. Very simple. This is three payloads. I'm going to show you payload one at the beginning. But this this is a modified version. It just looks for the JS and injects it. feature in Windows 7, you know, for the walls. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> <coughs> Just for the fun of it, this is the payload. That's it. Three lines. All you need to make someone's computer talk. Freak them out. Now, an interesting feature with gadgets, because they're IE based, if you own them once, it's in the cache, so you keep owning them. So I delete them. Hmm. So, another quick demo this is the, um, the input from the proxy, it gets a request, and find the code, and that's it. So, next demo, fun one. I'm going to use a different payload so the proxy to listen in. So every gadget goes to the proxy. I have my interpreter ready. And I have it serving a shell file on, on the network. So I go back here. And if you look at the desktop, this is what you see. And I open my favorite gadget. Oh, pops the shell. Go back. You see the request to pull the file has been made. The file was delivered.
and do it again. The reason I'm going to do it again and not simply just double click and show it, yeah, it works. It's because it's like um, it's some sort of chaining exploit, chaining vulnerabilities that I want to explain to you. Um, let's see. Still serving it. July 
basically saying, okay, there's a problem with gadget. Here is a, a, a fix-it solution that removes it from the OS. No gadgets anymore. No gadgets for you. What else they did was they removed uh, backwards compatibility in Windows 8. So you, at, at a certain point in time, in Windows 8 beta, you had gadgets on the desktop, and they removed it. So now they stick to the Metro Metro style apps, or they renamed it. And it was a funny story about this. We were working, me and my partner working with Microsoft, we were emailing back, emailing back and forth for about a month, and after a month we get an email from Microsoft, and all during that month we say, oh, we found this, oh, we can do that, oh, we can do this. And after a month we get an email back, we have to talk. <laughs> Conference call with Microsoft. It's, it's like two GMTs, 10 hour difference. I'm in the middle of the night talking to Microsoft. And they kind of relax us a little bit. 10 minutes into the conversation, they say, we have decided to drop the feature. We were like, okay. And we, were, and we, we thought of ways to tell them you can fix it like this, you can fix it like that. There was a, all of it went out the window and we were just, our jaws dropped. We didn't expect Microsoft to say, we're going to completely remove this from Vista and 7. And that's it. If anyone now today can go into the Windows uh, Microsoft page for this and click fix it and it will remove it from Vista and 7. I suggest you do so. A little bit of thank yous. Um, Prime work. Three CDs. Only CDs I found regarding gadgets from 2007 by Aviv Um They were on the default gadgets of Microsoft, the ones that you use today. I have not looked at those gadgets. I have not tried to pen test those ones. I am not a web guy. If someone can find a vulnerability in the default gadgets again, goodies. Um, Fun part, the, the, the 2007, the middle one, the 3033, that one was still in effect for a gadget in 2012 from a big company that installs it by default with their software. You can't say the name. Um, presentations, um, Inherited Security Widgets and Gadgets, DEFCON 15, Aviv and Ian. Um, Jinx, Malware 2.0, that's Itzik and, and Jonathan. Basically what they did was, uh, Enable uh, botnets and command and control servers based on JavaScript. So you have the code out there in demo from presentation years ago. All you gotta do is take a gadget, put the client code, package it, send it away, and you've got your own botnet. References. Security model. This is a great document. If you want to reference how to write a document, go to that link. That's it. Thank you. Any questions real quick for one minute? Stick your hand up. Real high. No questions? No, no one wants to know what about HTML5? And gadgets? Oh, no. no one? Okay. So uh, HTML5 is enabled in gadgets by default because it uses the engine of the IE. So. What you can do with an HTML, normal HTML, you can do with HTML5 and gadgets. Hello, hello. Georgia? Chrissy, no questions? None? I've got no more free beer, but... Anyone wants to ask me and talk to me later, I'll be wandering around. Feel free to come up to me and talk to me. Another round of applause. Thank you.